first off, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, let me warn everyone, this is the first time I've given this talk. So, so uh, it's, it's not quite maybe uh, smoothed out yet. We'll see how that happens. Okay. Uh, so so the, the, the idea for this talk kind of begins with the following. Uh, it, it's been long understood that that sort of lower bounds uh, on Ricci curvature on a manifold uh, are closely connected to the analysis on that manifold. There, there are a lot of ways of saying this uh, at this point. Uh, maybe a, a nice one of the estimates of Bakri, Emery, and Ledeau, which uh, basically to get, they give you ways in which, which uh, the, the heat flow behaves uh, on a manifold with lower Ricci bounds and the, the way gradients of functions behave under this flow. And what's important about those estimates is that they, they don't just sort of give estimates under lower Ricci curvature, but they're actually equivalent to the lower bounds on Ricci curvature. So you can tell when a manifold has a lower bound on Ricci curvature if these estimates hold. Uh, and, and this way you, you, you can really make precise something to the effect of you know, lower Ricci, uh, if and only if uh, uh, analysis on the manifold. By the way, I apologize for the awful handwriting. I'm still getting used to writing on a computer screen. <laughs> um, so, so the, the, I mean, various applications of uh, this exist, you know, one of which is the fact that they, they, these estimates can be made sense of even on very singular spaces, right? So, so you can make sense of what it means to have a lower Ricci bound, even in places where you cannot compute lower Ricci bounds. And maybe more to the point, these are really first steps toward really a, a fairly rich structure theory, which exists for these spaces at this point. And so, so now, more recently, it's been kind of understood and discovered that that two-sided bounds on Ricci curvature also have an analytic description. The, the, the new point here, really, is that uh, to understand estimates uh, on the manifold that are equivalent to two-sided Ricci bounds, you, you really have to move to the path space uh, of the manifold. So, so the, these estimates you have on heat flows under lower Ricci turn out to lift to estimates on, on the path space on martingales, which is sort of the right replacement for, for, for heat flow up there. Uh, and this way, you, you, you can once again sort of get, get an equivalence of, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. It's good. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Uh, please stop me if there's, there, there, there's questions. Uh, this, this is one of these talks where uh, there's going to be all this analysis on path space. So, so people who are used to that usually aren't used to the geometry, and people used to the geometry aren't used to the analysis on the path space. Um, so, so there's usually, uh, I think, if people are being fair, uh, reasonable questions to ask. Okay. So what one discovers is that said correctly, bounded Ricci curvature is actually equivalent if and only if you have analysis on the path space of the manifold. And <clears throat> this, this can actually be done in a way where, where all the estimates you get on the path space of the manifold, when you apply them to the simplest functions on, on the path space, these are so-called cylinder functions of one variable, they, they reduce entirely back down to the Bakker-Emery estimates, for instance. So in this way, you really are lifting estimates from M to the path space. They are generalizing in this way to, to produce the, the upper bound. So the, the uh, the starting point for this talk well, was that we wanted to do something similar for, for other estimates for, for, uh, on manifolds. And in particular, the, the, the next most interesting estimate that one really wants to understand are, are differential Harnack inequalities. So, so uh, I'll remind you a little bit about what those are as we go through. Um, but but uh, the, the idea here is that you know, one starts with the Li Yao differential Harnack inequality on, on a manifold. And this, this is something that, that you, requires a lower bound on Ricci curvature once again. And we want to see that if you have a two-sided bound on Ricci curvature, then, then it will lift to a certain type of estimate, to a certain type of differential Harnack inequality on the path space. Now, it will turn out not to be a single differential inequality. It'll be a family of differential inequalities uh, up on the path space. And once again, in fact, what we'll see is that when we apply this to the, the, the simplest functions on path space, it will kind of reduce down and entirely so sort of reconstruct the, the, the Liao Harnack. So, so we'll spend most of our time kind of just working up to the statements and trying to understand everything behind what, 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 what's going on there. Oh, the, the, the writing stays. Let's get rid of that. Okay, so, so I'm sure there's a more efficient way of erasing all this. Um, okay, so, so let, let me outline the talk real quick. So, We'll, we'll, we'll start off with a few basics. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some background on Ricci curvature and I'll basically just kind of remind you in 20 lines or less how to think about it and what it is. Uh, from there, we'll, we'll 
uh, I'll, I'll remind you of what, what differential Harnack inequalities look like uh, on it. So, so we'll state the Liao differential Harnack, and then I'll talk a little bit about how one uses it and why it's actually important in the analysis anyway, so we have a bit of a feel for it. Uh, in order to generalize this to, to, to path space, uh, we're going to have to learn how to do analysis on, on path space. So, so much of this talk will be about crash coursing you on this. There's generally speaking three ingredients that we're going to need to know. Well, we're going to need to know how, how to uh, build reasonable functions to actually compute with. Uh, we're going to have to have you know, a measure for integration because really what is analysis? Analysis is functions, integration, and differentiation. So, so we need a measure to integrate and, and we're going to have to introduce differentiation and we're going to be having to talk, since we'll be talking about things like Laplacians, that means connections. Well, we'll need to have, you know, derivatives of vector fields going on here. So, so we'll spend some time learning about, so about the right notion of connection uh, on a path space in which to work. It's, it's actually a bit subtle and we'll use this to build all our Laplacians. And, and from there, we'll, we'll end by, by stating our, the differential Harnack inequality on the manifold. Okay, uh, people should absolutely be stopping me with questions, by the way. Okay, so, so background, real basic stuff. And, and here's just an n-dimensional Riemannian manifold through, throughout this talk, easy enough. Um, what is curvature? So, so here's my usual sort of three minute spiel I give at the beginning of talks so that we sort of have a feel for what it is as opposed to just a definition. So the ugly definition of this is this, it's a four tensor. Uh, it's something you get by, by taking three vector fields and it gives you a vector field, right? So, so you take some vector field Z, you, you look at the XY derivative, and you look at its anti-symmetric part, so, so minus the, the YX derivative. Something that, that vanishes on Euclidean space, of course, but it does not vanish on, on a manifold. So, so fine, you can do that, and that defines your, your curvature tensor, but this doesn't help you at all in terms of understanding how one does analysis and how you should think about it. Uh, the way you should think about curvature is, is that, you know, it's a four tensor, your, your metric's a two tensor, it is the right replacement for the Hessian uh, 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 of the metric. The, the actual Hessian is zero, by basically by definition uh, of, of what the, the connection is. But the curvature is what, what really should replace the, the, the second derivative of a metric. So if you have a manifold, and if it has a two-sided bound on curvature, this should behave like a function on Rn with C2 bounds. And one can really make precise sense of this, and it really is true. Um, again, mod choosing coordinates, right? There's this diffeomorphism gauge in the background, but th this is how this really behaves. Um, so, so this is why you know analysts love that condition. It's it's basically stopping your your, your metric from changing too much. Once you say it this way, I mean, well, what, what, so what's the Ricci curvature? Um, the Ricci curvature is the trace uh, of the curvature. And if we're going to be interpreting the the curvature as the Hessian of the metric then if we take its trace, that should be interpreted as the Laplacian of the metric. And again, it's clearly a very nonlinear Laplacian, but it does behave this way. And in particular, this is why Ricci curvature appears everywhere in Riemannian manifolds. It's the same reason Laplacians of functions appear everywhere for functions. I mean, it just does. Uh, in particular, if one has bounds on, on Ricci curvature, you should expect some sort of estimates and bounds on, on the metric because it's kind of like having a nonlinear, you're solving some nonlinear equation elliptic, maybe mod something. So, so this is going to be our, our, our basic tensor of study, the Ricci curvature, which of course in coordinates is an absolute horrendous mess and nobody thinks about it this way. Okay, so differential harmonic inequality. So, so quick overview, right? Some of this I kind of said in my, my, my outline, but let me say it again, because I think for talks like this, repetition is helpful. Um, the, the moral where all of this started, right, is that estimates on M that you get under lower Ricci curvature should lift to estimates on the path space under two set of Ricci curvature bounds. So that, that, that's the moral we're trying to explore with, with uh, various series of papers that we're having come out. And some of the previous results we had on this were basically lifting estimates on, uh, of heat flows on the manifold, namely the, the bakram lido estimates and, and some, some comparable things. To, to estimates on martingales on the path space, which is what really ends up taking the place of, of the heat flow upstairs. And after we did this, the, the, the remaining question we had was, what, what, what's the, the, you know, what other estimates might actually lift upstairs? And the one that was left over that was maybe the most important, certainly in our heads, was, was the Liao differential Harnack. So, so this is an important estimate because it's a key one that exploits dimension. Um, you, the estimates you get out of this are, are things like heat kernel bounds. And, and so, so, you know, th this has a dimension inside of it, whereas many of the other results, even if they have dimension, that this is the, the one that really kind of exploits it in the best way. 
So one, one wants to be able you know, to do, do your sharpest analysis, one expects you to be able to use such a, such a thing on path space. Um, <clears throat> so, so, so to discuss the generalization of path space, uh, we're, we're gonna build a, a family of in inequalities, a differential inequalities. They're gonna have a feel that's more like a plurisubharmonic feel. So right, if you're on a, a Kähler manifold or something with a complex structure, you, you oftentimes don't end up with, with, with just functions that has, say have you know, bounds on the Laplacian or, or sign bounds on the Laplacian. You end up with functions that, that are plurisubharmonic or something, right? That they have bounds on the Laplacian in every complex direction, right? It's a whole bunch uh, of two-dimensional directions that you have bounds on the Laplacian in those directions. And this is gonna have a very similar feel. You're gonna have a whole bunch of not two-dimensional subspaces, but n-dimensional subspaces. And you're gonna basically have bounds on the Laplacian uh, of, of certain functions. Uh, um, in, in these directions up on path space. And this is what's gonna generalize the, the, the Liao. And once again, one's gonna have this sort of interesting thing where if we take the easiest one of these inequalities, uh, um, Laplacian inequalities on path space and apply it to the, the easiest functions on path space, we'll recover the Liao. So what's Liao? Classical Liao, it's the following. So, so start with a non-negative solution of the heat flow. On, on your manifold. Um, so, so DDT minus the Laplacian of F sub T equals zero. The, the, the Liao differential Harnack inequality uh, under a non-negative Ricci condition. And everything I'll say in this, 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 this talk will really generalize to either you know, general lower bounds or general, general two-sided bounds, but everything is much cleaner if we just call this bound zero. Um, so, so, so most of my statements will be under that case just to avoid annoying constants that, that don't add to the intuition, they just add to the complexity. So they prove that. Right? Then they, they prove that the, the, the Laplacian of your function over the function minus the gradient squared of the function of the function squared plus n over 2t is not negative for, for your solution. And this has a lot of nice has, uh, of applications. So, so one of which is the standard Harnack, which is why you call this the differential Harnack. Um, essentially, you can integrate this along geodesics in order to get, get bounds on how much your, your solution of the heat flow can change at different points in time and at different points in space. Note this is sharp for like a heat kernel on Euclidean space. And the other application that's kind of nice here is that if we look at the heat kernel, um, uh, uh, so, you know, you take some points, it's like the Dirac delta, that point X, you flow, say, in Y will be my flowing variable just for the sake of arguments uh, by the heat flow. And then you get something that looks kind of very kind of Gaussian in nature. And what you can prove is that the, 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 the Laplacian, the log of this thing, has an upper bound uh, of n over 2. One should view this as kind of like a smooth version of the, the Laplace comparison theorem, right? So we know that if you have non-negative Ricci curvature, that the Laplacian of distance squared is less than or equal to, I don't know, 2n or something. If you look at the left-hand side of 2 and you let t go to 0, then, then what you're doing is recovering that, right? So this, this is really like a smooth out version of the Laplace comparison theorem. Uh, you, you get this, by the way, just by plugging in, you know, rho into f up there and then rewriting that in terms of the log. And right? so those first two terms just combine into a log. It's, it's prettier that way. Uh, I'm writing it like one because, so, so, you know, the thing that was hardest for us was to figure out what this generalization on path space looks like. There's about 16 ways of writing this differential Harnack. And if you try to generalize them on the path space, they will all look very different. Uh, one is the one that would generalize most naturally. And just as sort of a, uh, you know, a brief crash course review, uh, there's also Hamilton's matrix Harnack, which in, in fact will generalize this as well, but it'll have ugly constants involved. Um, it won't be as pretty as for the, the, the Ricci flat or the, the bound the Ricci case. So, so if you have non-negative <laughs> curvature in parallel Ricci tends What's that? Uh, so, Professor, so if we have in the Harnack inequality, do we have the heat kernel for the... I'm sorry. You're, you're, you're cutting in and out. Can you try that one more time? Uh, hi. Uh, hi, man. I have a question. Yeah. Can you yeah, hear me? Yes. So if we have the equality in the the Harnack inequality, like the uh, inequality one on your slide, yes. so do we really know that is the Euclidean heat kernel? This is a good question. So you have equality there. Um, if you ask me, 
I would say not exactly. Uh, my guess is that you, so for instance, a weird looking, so if you're a smooth manifold, maybe. Um, but my guess is that another thing that might actually hold in one is as a singular space, if you had a cone space and you're at the cone point, then the heat kernel at that point should also probably satisfy one. So, okay. so for a smooth space, I would, you know, if you're a cone, you have to be Euclidean. So, so in that case, maybe. Um, okay. So, so if you ask me to guess, I would guess yes for a smooth manifold. Um, but it's a subtle point, and it's, it wouldn't be true on a singular manifold. Okay, so so how about the next few case? Say you only have a rigid lower bound. Can we characterize the hyperbolic space for the heat kernel there? Uh, the 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 Li, the Liao for for negative bounds on the Ricci curvature. It, there's about forty of them out there, and they're kind of just starting to converge to something that looks reasonable. Um, like the original ones, Bai Li and Yao were clearly very weak and not good enough for applications. And then there have been a series since then that have been better. I'm not sure if any have been written down that can characterize that. I mean, you can characterize in other ways, uh, um, but through a Li Yao, uh, it's a sort of differential hardnet type inequality. It's not clear to me. I mean, it's just not clear to me. I haven't looked at them carefully enough lately to, uh, to say that you can characterize hyperbolic space. But it's a subtle point, and certainly older versions, the answer would be no. Okay, sure. Thank you. Sure, no problem. So, um, Hamilton's matrix Harnack is almost the same, but untraced, right? Take one, pretend like you're not tracing, and what you get is three. So the, again, this holds on Euclidean space for, for the heat kernel. Um, and, but more generally on a manifold, if you have lower sectional bounds and parallel reaching, uh, then this also holds. Okay. So now most of this talk will be about trying to extend that to, to the path space. So, so the main thing that, that, that we're gonna need to do this, right, is we gotta figure out how to do analysis on path space. Analysis on path space, actually, analysis on, on any space has three main ingredients, right? So, so we, we need to understand a good collection of functions to work with. Uh, so intuitively, right, if, if you're just proving the Sobolev inequality on Rn, what you don't do is start with the Sobolev function and start to manipulate it, right? What you start with is a smooth function with compact support where you, you can manipulate this thing in any way you please. And as long as you start and end at something that'll be continuous in, this, in the right topologies, uh, you, you'll, you'll get something that holds by, by density. And certainly on an infinite dimensional computation, this, is, this holds even more, right? You, you want something good that's easy to work with uh, for computations. The, the, the second thing we want is we want a measure to do integration. Turns out there's a great one on path space, right? That this is the, the, you know, essentially this is coming from Brownian motion. It's coming from the heat kernel is the way you should really think about it. Um, but we'll, we'll write down what that is. And the last thing we need to do is take derivatives. So we're gonna need connections on the path space. So, so we're gonna spend probably the next half hour going through these three things so that, that we can end with our, you know, next 20 minutes going through these three things. So we can end with, with uh, you know, understanding what, how this all works. A couple of morals to take away about analysis and geometry on the path space, just sort of general points to, to help with those who haven't thought about this much. Um, first off, the, the metric you're going to have on path space is the H1 metric. Um, why comes down to stochastics? The, the, the H1 metric is very compatible with the type of methods that come from stochastic analysis. So, so stochastic analysis will mostly be hidden in this talk because I'm just trying to work up to, to, to statements more than I am really proofs. But you know, behind the scenes is stochastic analysis, and the H1 metric is the right one there. The, 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 the gradients we'll have, say even on functions, won't just be A gradients, right? I, uh, I won't be talking about you know, A derivative or A gradient, I'll be talking about families of them. What's gonna be much more natural here is to consider families of, of gradients that basically restrict the derivative to finite dimensional subspaces. So each one of the, the, these, which we'll define at some point, each one of these gradients, which depends on the, the, this background choice of an H1 function phi, will we'll basically measure how a function changes in a certain n-dimensional space of directions that's determined by phi. So, so it's a family of finite dimensional gradients. This is somehow just clean in infinite dimensions. This, this is also what's gonna work most natural for, for the end estimates. And just as a quick point, which we'll come back to, the connection we're gonna be dealing with is either the Markovian connection or Cartan connection. They're both H1 connections, but interestingly, they, they, they behave in ways that are closer to like an L2 connection than an H1 connection. So, so if you have the you know, L2 metric on paths and you look at its Levachevia connection, 
that turns out to be a bad connection. But these these two connections, the Markovian, basically have the best of both worlds. They kind of behave like that, but they're H1 connections with certain other nice properties. So, so again, we'll define that carefully. I'm just sort of outlining it for the moment. And you want this because what you want is define a Hessian, right? So, so a Hessian means two derivatives. That means, you know, you take a functional derivative, so a, a, function, a derivative of a function f, and then you take another derivative of that. It's like you need to take a derivative of a vector field or a one form, right? So you need a connection. That'll give you a Hessian, and then you can trace. And, and this will give us a family of Laplace operators. Each of these things, again, Laplace operators on infinite dimension are a mess because you're tracing over an infinite number of directions. You can get infinity a lot, but these are more like finite dimensional Laplaceans. They're all tracing over finite dimensional, indimensional for that matter, subspaces. So that th these will be well-behaved, you know, finite Laplaceans that, that there, there's really no, no, you know, modulo the usual type of uh, theorems you prove about being a closed operator, that they're, they're well-behaved. Th these are what will appear in our differential Harnack in the end. Okay, so let, let me introduce you to what a path space is and how, how what, what we're talking about. So rigorously speaking, we're talking about the, the space of, of C0 paths, continuous paths, and, and two, two of the manifold. Uh, usually it'll be sub X, which means base paths. So these, these paths all start at some point X and then they do whatever they wanna do in the manifold. Um, that this is continuous paths and not smooth paths is very important, uh, right? If you've done stochastics, it's completely clear to you why that's the case and otherwise, it's, it's, it's a technical monstrosity to actually deal with, but you have to, and I'll kind of explain why uh, as we're going through it. Um, so we're looking for natural structure uh, on the path space. Structure in, in order to build things like, like, you know, good collections of functions, measures, so forth and so on. The, the place to start with this is that it turns out that path space here, right, has a natural collection of, of, of functions, like completely canonical. Namely, for every partition, so, so sequence of times t1 through tk, you can consider the evaluation map. So it's a mapping from path space into n to the k, uh, which is simply given by, by you know, the dumbest thing possible. You, you take your curve gamma and you evaluate it at t1 through tk. Right? That gives you a point in n to the k. And this, this sort of collection of mappings is extremely useful. So, so the, the, the most basic thing you can do with it is if you want to get real valued functions out of this, you can basically just take real valued functions on n to the k now and pull them back. And this, this is what cylinder functions are. So cylinder functions, and this is our good collection of functions to work with, there are going to be functions on the path space, which you get by picking a partition and therefore an evaluation map, and some function f on n to the k, and simply pulling it back by the evaluation map. That is capital F of gamma is just equal to little f of gamma of t1 through gamma of tk. In this way, we really see that, that you know, each of these functions uh, um, is, is really finite dimensionally behaved. So, so you know, a lot of our worries about how to compute and what to compute will kind of go away as, as sort of being a nice dense collection of functions. <clears throat> okay, so, so that, that gives us our collection of functions. Well, well what, what about a measure? So, 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 here, 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 here's a moral to sort of keep in mind. Uh, imagine for a minute that, that, that we have a, a measure on, on path space, uh, any measure we want, right? So, so then, then we, we have our, our evaluation maps, right? So we have, draw some pictures here. So if we evaluate under some partition to into the K, uh, mapping to into the K, then if we have a measure on, on on, on the path space, then we can push it forward to a measure on, on some finite dimensional space into the K. All these evaluation maps, right, give us push forward measures. If we have a measure, of course, there's lots of measures on path space. If we have any measure on path space, we can push it forward to measures on into the K. And now one thing though that this is gonna have to satisfy is a certain compatibility condition. So if I have this, this evaluation map to, to, to into the K, I have another evaluation map uh, which is, I'll call that ET here, so let me erase that one, which if I forget the last coordinate, so, so T to the K, for instance, then I can also push forward to M to the K minus one by the evaluation map that just doesn't have that last time. So, so I'll call this ET prime. Then what you have to have, right, is that if you push forward to end of the K, and then you push that down to end of the K minus one by forgetting that last factor, 
or if you push the measure forward to, to n to the k minus one, you have to get the same thing, right? So, so, so a measure on PM is really defined by, by a family of measures on finite dimensional spaces. So, so this, this is what sometimes you'll call a cylinder measure going in this direction. So what's nice about this is that, you know, for every partition, you, you have a push forward measure on, on n to the k, and they have to satisfy this compatibility condition where it doesn't matter how you push forward uh, in order to get the, the, the right measure. And what you can try to do is go the other way around. So if you can find uh, an association to every partition, a measure on n to the k, which will have this compatibility, you can ask, does that come from a measure on path space? Right? This, 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 this is the classical way one does it. And it turns out to be a fantastic way to look for, for, for such a, a, a family of measures. So, so namely, given a partition t to the k, we can define a measure on n to the k by, by a product of heat kernels. So, so take, take, the, take the heat kernel of, of our Laplace operator, multiply them together with the various, so, so x here is our fixed base point, right? y1 through yk are our, our variables in n to the k. And then product together a whole bunch of heat kernels with, with the difference in time, so the two points. And what you'll notice is that, you know, if I were to say forget that t to the k factor and push down to the t to the, t to the k minus one, then the measure you get by pushing four down is like integrating out that y to the k factor, which should sum the last two times, which is exactly what the, 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 this push forward is here if I had, you know, first just assigned this measure to uh, into the k minus one. So this has the right compatibility condition. It's just coming from the semigroup property of, of the heat flow. And it turns out, you know, now one can ask the question, does this come from a measure? And the answer is yes, it comes from the Wiener measure. Um, so the, the Wiener measure on, on path space, mind you, continuous path space, not smooth. This does not concentrate on smooth paths, it concentrates on continuous paths. So this Wiener measure on path space, it's basically like the ultimate heat kernel, right? It has all the information about the heat kernel at every point and every time. It also has all the information about how every heat kernel at every point and every time interacts with every other heat kernel from every point and every time. Right, so there's this one measure on path space sort of really you know represents analysis in a really great way. Uh, it represents the heat flow and how it interacts with itself. So this is our measure now. So we have a good collection of functions on path space, and we have a measure to do integration on on path space. Everyone doing all right? This is one of those things where, where if you've seen this before, it's it's very slow, and if you haven't before, it's a lot to take in. Okay, so, so derivatives. Um, so first I'm gonna tell you how to get a derivative of functions because it'll let, let us introduce some notation anyway. And then, then we'll talk about connections after that. So first off, well, well here's a general moral. What, 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 you know, gradients, what, what, what's a gradient, just generally speaking? And talking about a manifold, talking about path space, talking about a metric space. Gradients are, are essentially, you know, they're geometric derivatives, right? The differential of a function makes sense without geometry, right? You know, the, the DF as a one form, right? It's just measuring directional derivatives. You don't need a geometry to do this. Where does geometry come into play? Geometry comes into play for a gradient because it's deciding what a norm one direction is. It's deciding what directions are sort of unit directions and which ones aren't. And this is how you determine what a gradient is. That is, it's taking directional derivatives in special directions. That, that's how one gets gradients. So, so, you know, and then, you know, mind you, path space is a perfectly nice bonic manifold. Directional derivatives are, in fact, for the cylinder functions, you just, you know, it's a nice exercise. They're very easy to compute here. So let's recall a few things in order to do this. So, so what we want to work toward is finding what the special collection of directions are going to be to define our, our gradients. The special collection of directions is going to come up over and over and over again. So it's worth taking a minute. So first, let's recall well, what a tangent vector on path space looks like. Right, so, so a tangent vector on any space is basically supposed to be like, you know, a variation of that point, right? So if I have a, you know, gamma sub s, a family of, of curves, well, what, what does DDS of that look like? It looks like a vector field along that curve, right? So a tangent vector on path space is just like a vector field along gamma, right? a continuous one in, in this case, at least continuous in this case. So what we're going to be working with in terms of tangents, so, so our, you know, our vectors at points of path space or vector fields along gamma. And the other thing I want to recall here is that we have a natural parallel translation map, right? So we have this fixed point X and P sub T here is going to mean taking our, our, our curve gamma. So, so this is, let me take our curve gamma. 
gamma, where we're gonna take some some v here, and then we're gonna you know, do something like this, right? Here's p sub t v, right? We 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 parallel translate it along. So p sub t is gonna be our parallel translation map uh, along gamma. Um, for those of you who are paying really close attention, yes, this can be defined for 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 almost every curve with respect to the the, the Wiener measure. Um, you know, but think smooth curve; it really doesn't matter for for the sake of our talk. So, okay. So disadvantages of a uh, screen talk because I can't leave the pictures up very long. Okay, so so. So here's the special collection of curves that we're going to talk about. Take a vector v at the tangent space of some point m, and take some h1 naught map on r. So this is just a mapping from zero to infinity into r, which is h1, right? It's, uh, phi of zero, uh, phi of zero is zero. And we're going to find the following vector field in uh, the kind of a silly way. We're just going to take our, our vector v, and we're going to parallel translate it along um, uh, gamma. And so here's our, our gamma again, maybe here's our original V and we parallel translate it as always, but now what we're doing is we're multiplying its length by, by, by phi. Boy, that's awful handwriting. So we'll take V, we'll parallel translate it, and then we'll let its length, I mean, so phi is basically determining the frequency of this vector field. It's telling, it's telling you how it's oscillating up and down, but its direction's being determined by V initially. And note that this is an n-dimensional subspace uh, of vector fields for, for a fixed phi. So, so if I were to, to, to fix phi here in all of this, then what this would give me is an n-dimensional subspace uh, of, of of vector fields, right? So, so we'll, we'll call that E sub phi. E sub phi here is the span of these guys for, for every V in the tangent space at your initial point uh, of your curve. So associated to every H1 not mapping into R, what you're getting is an n-dimensional distribution uh, on path space, an n-dimensional subspace assigned to every curve gamma. And this is gonna be the special collection that we're gonna use to define gradients and Laplacians and Hessians. So specifically, our phi gradient is nothing but, but the usual gradient, but restricted to these directions. So, so given a phi and given some function f, think cylinder function, so it's a nice thing that our directional derivatives are particularly easy to compute for these guys, then the phi gradient is going to be a, a, a mapping from the path space, it's a new function on the path space, into the tangent space at x, uh, given by, you know, its component in the v direction is just the, direc the directional derivative of f in the v sub phi direction. So, the, the, this phi gradient is telling you how f is, you know, the directional derivatives of f are, are changing in this special collection of directions. So what we really have here is a family of finite dimensionally behaved gradients uh, on our space. But if you put them all together, you can recover infinite dimensional gradients like the h1, right? So, so if, you, if you take, you know, phi i to be an h1 orthonormal basis, then basically just by summing up all of these phi gradients, what you're gonna produce is the H1 gradient, sometimes called the Malleolian gradient on path space. How are we doing? Okay, so, so, so th this is how we take derivatives, right? We, we have this nice collection of, of finite dimensional subspaces. And we, we, we look at derivatives in these directions. So, so the next thing I have to do is introduce you a connection on path space. Um, so, so this is because we want to define Hessians and Laplacians, the functions on path space. To do this, we have to take derivatives of derivatives, which, which is say, you know, derivatives of vector fields, which means connections, right? So, so we have to go one up on the geometry here. So, so the most natural connection out there is the L2 connection. So it's the thing that you can compute with really, really easily. It is unfortunately a pretty terrible connection for, 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 for most purposes here. Um, so, so I'll give you a way of writing the, the, the L2 connection explicitly in just a second. Um, if it's a lot of, of 
complicated looking things, you can basically ignore it. And you're just th thinking it, think of the Levitch bit connection with respect to the L2 metric, right? So, so it's something you can write down and especially on path space, it's really, really simple to write this thing down and compute with it. Um, the, the, we will be using it and it has a lot of good properties, but as a global connection, it turns out to be a really bad one. In particular, the differential hard acts do not hold with respect to it. Um, I'll sort of discuss on the next slide what, what it means to be a good connection and then how to define some. So the, 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 the L2 connection, if you want it more explicitly, it comes from the following. Um, let's actually do, do two slides here. So, so given a vector field on the path space and some, some tangent vector at some gamma, uh, the idea is that you can define the, the L2 connection, um, the covariant derivative of W in the V direction, um, to be the covariant derivative of the, the value of W at some time T in the direction V sub T. So this becomes something on M that, that, that works without, without any, any new notion of geometry. So let, let's draw a picture of this to see how this works. So here's my gamma. Right, here's some, some, shoot, here's, here's my gamma, here we go. Here's my gamma sub S, say. Uh, maybe here's gamma of T and gamma sub S of T. So the idea is that DDS of gamma here should be V, right? I mean, if V is supposed to be a tangent vector, it's telling you how the gamma sub S are moving in some direction. So what you have here is, S of T, right? So with T fixed, what you have here is just a curve in S starting at ga gamma of T, right? And then by definition now, v, W now, which gives a vector field along each of these gamma sub S's, right? It gives you a tangent vector, uh, tangent vector field along gamma sub S of T in, in terms of S. That means you can take the covariant derivative MM of this thing, right? Because it's really just a, a W is a, now a, a vector field along gamma sub s. I'm gonna learn how to write on this computer screen one of these days. And then that's all the L2 derivative is. So, so I mean, if, 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 if you haven't worked with this, basically ignore all this, it doesn't really matter. I'm not gonna use it. I'm just sort of introducing it here for the moment. Um, but if you thought for about 15 minutes, this is something you can compute with really, really easily when, when you sort of absorb what all the definitions are. The reason I'm introducing is it, that we will need it in the definitions uh, of what's to come. So just think L2, let it should be the connection. And one more thing that I'm gonna sort of mention for, for, for uh, uh, definition sake, you have one more nice piece of structure on path space here. Namely, given a vector field uh, along gamma, right? You can define a new vector field by looking at its covariant derivative in the gamma dot direction, right? So you can look at DDT of this thing. So, so path space has sort of a, if you want a natural operator uh, on the tangent space there uh, by, by, by DDT. So, so associate to every vector field um, V, you, you, you get gamma dot, the, the covariant derivative of V in the gamma dot direction. So th this is, of course, related to the H1 norm, right? You want to look at L2 norms of the derivative of V as opposed to just the L2 norm of V itself. Okay. Okay, so, so, so the next step is really more and more sort of broadly speaking. Um, so so we, we define this L2 connection, which is going to be the thing that's really, really easy to compute with when you get your head wrapped, wrapped around it. But we said it wasn't a good one. We said it really isn't appropriate for, for what's going on here. So the reasonable question to ask here is, what is a reasonable connection on, on path space? What kind of properties should it have in particular? So it should have four properties um, that, that make it a good connection. Basically, any connection that has these four properties, the differential hard axle will hold with respect to. And I'll give you two good examples. Um, <clears throat> the first is that it should be an H1 metric connection. You got this H1 norm on the tangent vectors and it should be an H1 metric connection. Uh, the L2 connection, right, is, is, is not, uh, except on Euclidean space, as it turns out. This is basically because taking time derivatives and taking L, uh, um, spatial derivatives don't commute unless you're, you're on Euclidean space because you have curvature. It should, your connection should respect something called the, the, the respect the sigma algebra. So I'll tell you what this means. Uh, um, 
if, if you know some stochastics, the way you say this precisely is that if V and W are processes, then so is the covariant derivative. But what that means is the following. So, so a vector field V is a process, right? So this is something that assigns to every gamma uh, a tangent vector along gamma, right? A vector field along gamma. So it's called a process. If given two curves, gamma and sigma, that agree up to time t, then the vector fields they assign also agree up to time t. Right? So if you have, here's gamma and here is sigma, right? So they, they, they agree from zero to t. Then the vector field assigned to, to gamma and sigma have to be the same up to that time too. That's called the process. You know, in principle, there, there's really no reason why a vector field needs to do that. But the claim is that if both V and W are processes, then the covariant derivative should also be a process. Um, in practical terms, this means it respects the stochastic analysis that's going on. So when you do stochastic analysis tricks downstairs for, for, for the proofs, uh, you can get away with it. The third condition is something called the, being a Markovian connection. So what it says is the following. So it says that if you look at DDT uh, of the covariant derivative of W in the direction of V, then that should be the covariant derivative of the derivative of W, W dot in the direction of V. So note, note there, there, there's a, a DDT both on the, that first and second term there, right? Plus, plus an error term A, or where A is supposed to be reasonable essentially. This is what you call a Markovian connection. Um, I won't say why, because I have to define what a Markovian process is and how this kind of relates to that. Uh, but, but essentially it's saying, once again, it respects certain stochastic analysis behavior nicely here. Again, the L2 connection does not satisfy this at all. Uh, note, by the way, this A is anti-symmetric, then, then, then your connection has, this is actually a way of defining connections, in fact. So you can write down an A and use that to define a connection by, by, by this process here. So this, this is actually how one builds families of connections on, on path space. And if this A is anti-symmetric, then you're gonna build a, a metric connection, H1 metric connection. And the final condition that one has to satisfy is that it has to be regular. So it has to be an L2 adaptive process. Um, basically that means it's not too wild is all it's saying. So this A can't be too nasty. This is the part where the L2 connection absolutely horribly fails. Um, is in the regularity condition. This is what makes it really not work at all for the differential hard hat. Like there's just no chance even mod other errors or something like that. And is that the L2 connection does not respect the, the time derivative in, in a good way. Okay, so, so, so what are some examples? Let me see, how are we doing on time? Uh, I, I, I imagine I want to finish about 50 or 55 after to, to make sure there's a few minutes before the next talk. Um, so, so let, let, let me try to just sort of say, well, what two good connections look like. Uh, hello. Sorry, it's not letting me slide very quick. That's okay. We can just sort of go through this. So two bad connections while I'm sliding through are the L2 connection and the H1 connection. So the H1, that is the L2 Lebesgue connection and the H1 Lebesgue connection. So since you want an H1 metric, what you might imagine is to use the H1 Lebesgue connection, but this is also terrible, as it turns out. Um, the curvature is terrible. It's highly non-Markovian. It, it doesn't really preserve any of the things you need to preserve. It doesn't basically cleanly tie into the stochastic analysis, is the point. The L2 connection is much closer, but it also doesn't really satisfy these other conditions to tie it in. What you need in the end is, is something that's basically in between the two. It's an H1 connection that, that is really close to the, 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 the L2 connection. And the, the first definition of one is called the Markovian connection. So it's defined by the following. By definition, if we, we so we won't define it by, by you know, the connection itself, we'll define what its time derivative is. All right, so we know what the L2 connection is, now of, e, of W dot. So that right-hand side there is completely well-defined for, for, for a couple of vector fields of V and W. And the left-hand side is just by definition, we can look at DDT of our connection as being that guy. So that is A is zero in, the, in, our, in, our, in our, from, from our notion of a Malleavian connection from before. Sorry, Markovian connection from before. So what's happening here really is that it's saying we're not looking at the L2 connection, but we're gonna conjugate it with a time derivative, right? So you're gonna take W, and instead of looking at its L2 connection, L2 derivative, you're gonna 
take its derivative, time derivative, look at the L2 derivative of that, and then you'll integrate in time. So that is, you know, the inverse of the time derivative. Out of it. So you're conjugating by the derivative map. And it turns out that that guy there ha has all the properties you want. It's an H1 connection, it's Markovian, it's regular, it behaves really well. In fact, if you're on Euclidean space, it's actually the same as the L2 connection. It doesn't actually change things. But when you're not on Euclidean space, th this is the much more better, this is a much better behaved object. So this is the connection we're going to be using. The curvature, by the way, on, 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 on path space is, is really easy to compute with this guy as well. It depends only on the curvature of the underlying manifold and in a pretty clean way. And let me introduce one more example because I, it'll be a reminder of, of the, the vector fields going on. And then I think we basically have one more definition after all this and, and we're done. Um, we, we can actually understand some, some theorems. So another good example of a good connection we call the Cartan connection. At least that's the name we made up for it. So let, 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 let's consider the, the, the previously defined vector fields we like so much. Remember, we start with the phi, which was just an H1 mapping in R. So, so you take some, some tangent vector at X of M, you parallel translate it out. That's what the P sub TV is, right? And that's, that's telling you the direction your vector field is looking at. And then it's oscillating by, by, by phi, right? Phi is telling you how this thing is oscillating. Then the Cartan connection by definition is simply the one for which all these guys are parallel. So if you think for a couple of minutes, this collection of vector fields gives you a trivialization of the tangent bundle uh, of path space. And the Cartan connection is simply the one where that trivialization is equipped with this natural flat metric on it. It turns out if you work a little bit, this thing is in fact an H1 connection, which is Markovian and regular. Uh, but the formula for it's much uglier, so I decided not to write it down. It is a flat connection, um, but it's not torsion free. Right. So in this way, it behaves very much like a, a, a connection on a lead group. This, this is why we call it the Cartan connection. Right? So it's got sort of a, it, it's flat. It, it's not torsion free. And somehow that torsion is really what's determining the, 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 the underlying geometry of how these things are interacting. Can I ask a quick question? Go uh, for it. This is Ezra Getzler. Um, hey, how you doing? <laughs> uh, so the Markovian connection, it, is it torsion free? <laughs> it is not. Right, because it is neither, not the neither of these, the neither of these two connections. Neither of these are torsion free, except to get on Euclidean space. Are there any regularization issues in in defining the torsion, or is the torsion just the torsion for these two guys is pretty clean? Okay, they both have pretty clean formulas. Okay, so okay. the answer is the answer is there's no real issue with that. In fact, I mean, in some sense, right, that, that that's one reason why why the, these are nice connections, right? Okay, okay, great, thanks. Yep. Okay, so, so for, for the rest of the talk, uh, um, Nabla hat will represent one of these two connections. I don't care which. Basically, all the results are verbatim for, for these guys. And in fact, any connection that satisfies the four conditions that I mentioned, um, well, Nabla hat could really be, but maybe there's an extra constant in general. But the way things are written, uh, it's a verbatim for, for, for both these guys. And, and as I mentioned, on path space of Rn, all these connections are the same as the L2 connection. Right, so somehow none of these, these complications really appear until there's geometry and there's some weird twisting going on. Okay, almost done, great. So, so finally we can define our Laplacian. This is what we really care about. So, so remember the idea at the beginning was that, well, besides having the right Laplacian, which is gonna be the, the, an issue, we, we wanted one that was actually finite. We, we, we wanted one where we actually understand and if you go tracing over an infinite number of directions, in principle, these things can't be infinite. One has to renormalize or do something else. Written like this, in fact, none of these issues will appear. Each piece of this, somehow the sums of all these guys will end up giving you something like an L2 Laplacian or an H1 Laplacian, depending on how you normalize. So those guys may be infinite, but each one of these guys is perfectly finite. Like there, there are no issues in dealing with all these. They're also the ones that are going to appear in the differential Harnack in a few minutes. Write down what they are in some sense. These are the most obvious things. So, so we've now defined a connection, so we can define a Hessian. We've defined these, this n-dimensional distribution coming from these vector fields, and we're just gonna trace in those n directions. That's all these are gonna be in like two minutes. So said slightly more slowly. So, so definition. So, so the phi Hessian is the following. Uh, I'm gonna think of this as something that takes a function on path space. It's going to give us a, a, a a function on path space with values in the, the tangent bundle of 
m at x, the base point tensor itself, uh, by 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 the, the the following, right? So so given two directions v and w, I'm going to look at just the actual Hessian of f, meaning the covariant derivative of the covariant derivative of f, where where that second covariant derivative is coming with respect to this Markovian Hessian of the Cartan connection, and I'm going to do it in the the phi sub uh, the, the 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 v sub phi or the w sub phi directions is all. Uh, for for explicit formulas, I, I wrote down what that Hessian looks like, so it's less abstract looking. Uh, that hat's in the wrong place, by the way. That that for that and then that last part there, the the that's that that that's a covariant derivative of a function, right? So that that, that first double derivative or of functions, the hat belongs inside that d sub there, where where that's where the covariant derivative of a vector field appears. And the, 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 the phi Laplacian is just the trace of this. So, so given a function on path space, you're going to get a new function on path space by taking its phi Hessian, right? And then tracing over an orthonormal basis uh, 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 in the, the, the tangent space of M. So if you want, if E sub phi is this n-dimensional distribution on path space defined from phi, then the, the phi Laplacian is simply the trace of the actual Hessian of F in that. So we're really just restricting the, 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 the tr it's just the trace of the completely normal Hessian, but in just those n-dimensional uh, dimensional subspace, not, not, not the whole trace. And, and on, on, on Rn, in fact, in general, if you normalize everything correctly, you can write this as being part of either the L2 or the H1 Laplacian, depending on how you're trying to normalize things. Okay, finally, there's a statement. Um, okay. So in fact, following this statement doesn't really require following much of this talk. So, so, so the, the, if you want it precisely, obviously you need that, but, but the, the moral kind of comes clear. You need a notion of derivative, you need a notion of Laplacian, and now we're going to write down some inequalities. So, so the differential Harnack, I'm going to do it for Ricci flat spaces because I can just avoid some extra constants. It doesn't really matter. It holds for, for more general spaces. You just get some extra errors, but it's clean here. Let's take a Ricci flat manifold, take a function on it, and take some, some phi, which is going to represent our n-dimensional, you know, what, what our phi Laplacian phi gradient is. Then we have the following inequality. So expectation there is just the integral with respect to the Wiener measure. So, so the, the integral with respect to the Wiener measure of the Laplacian of f over the integral of f minus the, the integral, the, the, the phi gradient of f squared over the integral of f squared plus n over two, let's just say the h1 norm is one, it is non-negative. So it's a family of differential inequalities. Uh, and, and what you should be comparing this to, right, is the, the Liao Harnack. It's got sort of formally a, a very similar kind of expression. So, so really, these estimates are more in the spirit of some sort of plurisubharmonic type estimates. Right, so for each subspace, we have that the, the Laplacians of the functions and these induced and this induced n-dimensional direction has, has appropriate bounds. Interesting corollary, by the way. Uh, if you let f here kind of tend to a Dirac delta, so then you're basically getting a getting the Wiener measure out of this. What you're formally getting, which you actually can make precise. Uh, what you're formally getting is that the phi Laplacian of the log of the Wiener measure has an upper bound of n over two for, for every single one of these n-dimensional distribution directions. So, so sort of compare this to the, the, the standard Laplace estimate you have on heat kernels, you know, the Laplacian of the log of the heat kernels bounded by n over two t. Uh, the, the, this can maybe be precise because even though the, the, the Wiener measure, of course, doesn't have a log because it's just a measure, uh, it turns out its gradient is well-defined. So, so you can make sense of its gradient. And once you do that, you can make sense of its Laplace. Somehow the Laplacian makes sense even though the, the, log, the, log of, the log of the function itself only makes sense up to an infinite dimensional constant. You have to subtract off it. OK, and, and I'm not going to, well, what I'm going to do here now, I'm going to end in like one minute, is just put this down to show that if you work for 20 minutes, what you can see is that when, when you plug this to the, 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 the simplest functions, on path space. So simplest function here means f of gamma is little f of gamma of t. Now, those are the easiest functions possible on path space. And they are functions of one variable. And if you apply this, this differential Harnack to those guys, what you recover is precisely the, the Liao differential Harnack. It's exactly the same thing. So, so in that sense, this really is a lifting of the Liao Harnack to path space, uh, but under a Ricci flat condition. 
Okay, I am out of time, so thank you. Um.